Welcome to Exploring A Course in Miracles. I'm Emily Bennington with the Circle of Atonement here with Robert Perry. And today we are talking about an, an important course teaching called The Real World. This is a concept that appears 94 times in the complete and annotated edition of A Course in Miracles. And it's definitely referred back to uh, again and again, particularly in the text and the workbook. So it's something that as students, we should understand, but also as spiritual seekers, we should embody because it's one of those ideas in the course that can make for an entirely different life if we apply it. If you want to know more about where to find the real world in the complete edition of the course, there's a section called the real world. It's chapter 11, section eight. And there's also the what is sections that in the workbook. So those are the, what is the Holy spirit? What is the ego what is a miracle and so on. And one of those sections is also called What is the Real World? We will be doing our best today to give you a fairly in-depth overview of the topic, but those are also places that you can refer to if you want to go deeper. Robert, just to get us started here, I guess we should begin at the beginning. So would you like to give us a overview of what is the real world in the course? Well, one of the first things to understand is the real world isn't heaven. It's, it's not the world. It's not heaven. The Course talks about it as a borderland between the two. And yet it says that if we attain the real world, we then, God will take the final step and, and lift us into heaven. The real world, and we'll obviously be drawing this out in much more detail as we go, but you could say that if you saw only what is real here in, in this world, you would be seeing the real world. It's what you see when you see with what the Course calls true perception or vision. When you, when you really see, you see what's real here, not the illusion, and that's the real world. And that's so funny because when parents say to us, for example, well, you're going to get a dose of it when you get out into the real world, the idea is that it's harder. We're, we're going to suffer more once we get out there in the real world. And the course, as the course tends to do, just flips that whole idea on its head and gives us a beautiful picture of what it's like to be in the real world. So whereas before we're supposed to be afraid of this thing, and now it's like, oh, wouldn't it be amazing to see that and be there? Yeah, you have to think, at least I think, that, that Jesus must have had that normal meaning of the term in mind when he crafted this term. Uh, and I found a great dic dictionary definition that captures what you were just saying. If Mary and Joseph said that to him, wait until you get out in the real yeah, world. Right. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> okay, so here's a definition from Longman Dictionary. The difficult experience of living and working with other people rather than being protected at home, at school, or at college. And, you know, we all know that that thing where your, your dad says, you know, when you get out into the real world, or you need to live in the real world. And that's like the dog eat dog world, right? The jungle. The jungle, you know, where it's ruthless and cold and hard. And you're right. I mean, the course has just really deftly turned that upside down and said, and basically is implying what we call the real world is the fake world. That's the illusion. And if we had eyes to see, we would see something else entirely, which is the opposite of hard and difficult and jungle-like. But we do have eyes to see. We just don't know it yet. Right, exactly, yeah. So one of the things that, that we should say at the very start is that what the Course describes as the real world is something that's here. It's what's actually real here but you can't see it with your eyes. And yeah. I so this is something the course says you can't, it's here. That's, that's the, the thing that's kind of mind blowing. It it's around us, 
but but we can't see it with our physical eyes. So how how do how do we see it? Well, just before we get there, um, I wanted to read a passage where it makes it very clear we can't see with our eyes. But also, I mean, just think about it. there's a lot of things that we consider real here that we can't see with our eyes. I consider your thoughts and feelings real, but I don't see them with my eyes. I never have and never will. So it shouldn't be that surprising that there that the real world would be something that's here but invisible to the physical eyes. That's a good way to put it. I hadn't considered that before. Yeah, we do consider thoughts and feelings to be real, but they're not sort of walking around on the floor. About, you know, we don't see them. So, <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> they yeah. make themselves known. <laughs> 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 yeah. Okay. So, this is a passage from, it's a really important passage from chapter 13 in the text. And it's kind of like a, almost like a proto workbook lesson. He says, sit quietly and look upon the world you see and tell yourself. And now here's what you tell yourself. The real world is not like this. It has no buildings and there are no streets where people walk alone and separate. There are no stores where people buy an endless list of things they do not need. So at this point you're thinking, okay, maybe it's like really natural stuff, right? He says he's ruled out buildings and streets and stores and consumer goods. Maybe it's just it's like a forest, right? But then he says, it is not lit with artificial light and night comes not upon it. There is no day that brightens and grows dim. There is no loss. Nothing, nothing is there but shines and shines forever. Well, every, every natural setting in this world has day that brightens, grows dim, and is replaced by night. So what is he talking? He's not talking about anything you can see with your physical eyes because everything you can see here has a night and day cycle. Yeah, it feels like one of those like holographic pictures where you you look at it and you see one thing, but then if you really can kind of train your eyes, you can see something else underneath it or within it rather. And the real world feels like that. Like we do see buildings and streets and light and dark and artificial lights. We've got it here in the cottage. So, but there, but it's interesting to think that there's something more going on here that we can train right. our eyes to see. Right. Or that we can, you know, open spiritual eyes within us that see what the physical eyes can't see. And that's just to get back to your earlier question. The course constantly talks about the body's eyes and the physical eye early in the text. And then it contrasts that with the eyes of Christ and the spiritual eye. And, you know, the, the teaching is that we have eyes within us that can look on what's real that our physical eyes can't see. Yeah. And we have done a podcast and we've talked in classes and whatnot about what the course calls vision. Can you say how the, co the real world applies to vision and true perception? Yeah. Well, vision and true perception are the same thing. The course just usually uses the word vision, doesn't use true perception very often. And vision is where you're really seeing which means you're seeing what's real. And so the real world is what you see when you see with vision. So when you see with vision and when you see the real world, what exactly are you seeing? Okay. So I've done studies of, of the term in the course, and there's four things that I've noticed being said about what you see when you see the real world, meaning when you see with vision, okay? So one is that you see a world composed only of the loving thoughts, our own loving thoughts and the loving thoughts of other people. Now, if you imagine just seeing a world where, where you considered only the loving thoughts to be real and everything else was kind of inconsequential being unreal, you would be seeing a very, very different world. So that's number one. 
Well, number two. Okay. So somebody, somebody, somebody yes. just has to say something about that. I mean, that's just amazing, amazing idea. And it's something that the course refers back to all the time, where when we think of our relationships, for example, we, we think of only the loving thoughts as being real and the only thing that's true in the relationship. And so Which this doesn't is, seem to be the case normally. No, no. And this is, this is what we've been talking about in classes and workshops and stuff. When relationships break and we're looking back on them, we tend to only see the ways in which we've been hurt. And what if we could look back on relationships that have broken and see only the loving thoughts is true and the relationships that we have within our lives now look at them and, and think only the loving thoughts are true. As I said in the intro, if we could apply that idea, we would have a different life. Yeah. Yeah. And we would live in a different world. And from a course perspective, that is the only thing that's true. Nothing real can be threatened. Nothing unreal exists. Only the loving thoughts are true. Therefore, they're the only thing that's real. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So number two is we see only the pure holiness in everyone, ourselves included, and all living things included. And this is the, the main focus when the Course talks about vision. Uh, but let me just go ahead and, and read this passage from chapter 17, because it, it links this with the real world. He says, can you imagine how beautiful those you forgive will look to you? In no fantasy, have you ever seen anything so lovely? Nothing that you remember that made your heart seem to sing with joy has ever brought you even a little part of the happiness this sight will bring you. For you will see the Son of God. So you will see the divinity, the holiness in others. And one of the characteristics of seeing that is you see an incredible beauty. It's not a physical beauty but it's described still as beauty. And then he says, this loveliness is not a fantasy. It is the real world, bright and clean and new. You know, I've been talking recently about equal rights and seeing e equality and beauty and worth and loveliness in every one. And that that has been that idea of equal rights has been the thing that has helped civilization advance, not fast enough, but it's been the thing that's helped us advance. And we've painted a distinction between equal rights and divine rights, where equal rights is a step, but what we're all where the course wants us to get to is to see each other with divine rights, where everyone is holy. So you're not just worthy, you are worthy but you're holy. And that's something that's like off the spectrum, I think, for how, yeah. how we look at each other the, now. We just look at each other as bodies misbehaving, as you like to say. But if we could look at each other and see past the body and see the holiness within each other, then we would be seeing the, the real world because that right. is the thing that's real about the other person. Right, and that's what our physical eyes can't see. So we have to have a different set of eyes open up that look on that holiness just as plainly as our physical eyes look on the body, which is an amazing mm -hmm. concept. One thing that has came to my mind is the equality being talked about is not an equality of the lowest common denominator, it's an equality of the highest common denominator, which is a good way to think Equal, about it. Equal sons of God. Right, right, yeah. yeah. Okay, so the next thing we see when we see the real world is we see only God's purpose in everything. Now, the Course stresses that normally we see everything as being there to basically fulfill personal interests of ours. The purpose of everything is to serve, you know, my personal needs somehow. Um, and when you're in the real world, what you see in everything is it's just there to fulfill God's purpose. Um, and I think that it has a couple different aspects. One is the purpose of every situation then becomes to learn how to forgive and to love and then to give love 
Um, and the purpose of every object is that it's there to be an instrument for extending, for communicating love. So we see the purpose of everything as not just being, as not being about our own ego needs and physical needs, but about serving God's purpose. Yeah, and this is, this is a really interesting part of the real world teaching, because I think at the most superficial level, we might be thinking, okay, my job is to go out there and see only what's real. And therefore the onus is on me to be the one who loves. And that's certainly part of it. But what you're saying and what the course is saying is, is actually there's another part and it's everything has a love for you too. And What's the next thing? And well, I'm just, I'm getting us there. <laughs> 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 that, that it has its own consciousness, if you will. I mean, that we talk about like, what does it mean to be a son of God? Well, of course, humans are in there, but of course, so are animals and so are rocks and so are grains of sand. These aren't things that we typically consider to be living. And so when we think of consciousness to include a rock or to include a grain of sand or to include a plant, it feels wild, but with the real world, we're not only loving everything, everything is loving us. So do you want to say more about that? Yeah, that's something that really has struck me because there's a bunch of passages that talk about it. And it just seems so outside of our ordinary experience. But let me go ahead and read some of these passages because you can see there's a really strong commonality running through them. So lesson 60 in the workbook says, everyone and everything I see will lean toward me to bless me. Just imagine looking around and everyone and everything is leaning toward you to bless you. Yeah, that's a whole different kind of love. Cause it's not just the, I love you because I think that you're worthy and valuable. It's like, I'm leaning. I, I want to hear everything that you have to say. I mean, that's a real kind of sincere love. So the leaning towards feels important. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, they're leaning, they're all leaning toward us to bless us. Like they can't wait <laughs> to bless us. Okay. Wow. So lesson 68 talks about a world that protects you and loves you and that you love in return. So a world that protects you and loves you. Now that is the opposite of the dog eat dog. Like when you get out in the real world, you know, you're going to find out it's a lot harder. Um, it's the exact opposite. Okay. Lesson 156 talks about inanimate things, loving you, the waves bow down before you and the trees extend their arms to shield you from the heat. And then finally, lesson 189, which was Bill Thetford's favorite lesson, says, it welcomes you, rejoices that you came, and sings your praises as it keeps you safe from every form of danger and of pain. It blesses you throughout the day and watches through the night as silent guardian of your holy sleep. It offers you its flowers and its snow in thankfulness for your benevolence. So all of those passages speak in these really like exalted and poetic terms about not just everyone, but everything, including waves and trees and flowers and snow, basically loving us, which like I said, is the opposite of that dog eat dog real world. Well, yeah. I mean, it's like you're in a freaking Disney movie where you're right. like <laughs> walking through birds are landing on your hands and whatnot. But um, it, it, I, I, I think the course is serious about that. I, I mean, I, I, I think that's an idea. The real world is obviously an idea to take seriously. What if we could imagine ourselves when we're on a walk in nature, for example, feeling like the nature is leaning towards us to bless us. It would be a whole different experience as we're, as we're out on that walk. And if we really got even just a fraction of this idea, how much more care 
would we take with each other, with our planet, with animals, for example, um, we wouldn't have factory farming, I think, if we really took this idea seriously. Yeah. And, and to just, your orientation towards life and God matters so much. And so if you have an orientation of everything really does want your good, everything is blessing you, it's not out to get you, it, it, it loves you. And you could really kind of see that as you're scanning your environment every day, you would have a different day and enough different days lead you to a different life. Well, and I think experience that certain people have shows us that, that then the world, including the natural world, would start treating you differently. There's all kinds of stories about holy people who walk out in nature and they are responded to differently by the animals, for instance, than, than most people. Does this I work saw, with mosquitoes? Because I <laughs> could assume repeat. it maybe does. Um, I saw this. They don't bless me. <laughs> <where They're> just... <laughs> in this video, I saw this guy was standing there and he was talking about if you really see God in everything, you know, <clears throat> they they respond to you. And he was standing, what looked like a few feet in front of this, of this kind of low tree or shrub that was full of birds that seemed to be having, you know, no issue with being right next to him. And while he's gesturing, a bird like lands on his finger. <laughs> now I've never been out in nature gesturing and had a bird land on my finger. See, it is a Disney movie. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Have it. So, so I think that, you know, what, what that lesson 156 seems to say is if the light in you steps forward and that light in you in that lesson is, is God, then, then nature responds to you, saluting you as savior and as God. So the waves are then bowing down to you. The trees are shielding you from the heat. And we know that to be true on some level, maybe not to the level that's being described here in the course's teachings on the real world, but we know what it's like to see someone who's sort of radiating that magnetic loving energy and you just want to be around them. And so if we can relate to that on a human level, on a personal level, Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't we think that something unseen can go on like that with nature as well? So, mm -hmm. yeah, Robert, just it makes sense. You, you love to find course teachings that are, that are similar to other teachings that are out there. And when it comes to the real world, there is something called Summerland, and and it feels very familiar that there's some similarities there. So do you want to talk about what Summerland is? Yeah. Uh, if you look at these descriptions in the course of the real world, like with the waves and the trees and so on, um, they do remind you of this concept. And it comes from 19th century spiritualism, which is mediumship, communication with the dead. And the notion that came out of that, which got picked up by the Theosophists and by the Wiccans, there's even a, um, a town in, in California in the Santa Barbara area called Summerland because it was founded by spiritualists. Um, so Summerland basically is the idea that, that if you are you know, loving and mature and healthy enough, when you pass over to the other side, you live in what might be called an idealized version of earth. And here's, an, here's a quote from an encyclopedia about Summerland. Descriptions by mediumistic communicators present the deceased as living a harmonious quasi-physical life amid supernally beautiful houses, lecture halls, music, gardens, meadows, trees, lakes, streams, and animals. Like other spheres, the summer land is a product of the minds of its inhabitants. So the idea is, is that the people in that sphere, I guess their subconscious minds being more, you know, focused on, on love and light, those minds get together and produce this environment that is what we would consider paradise. It's yeah. the paradise we all would love to live in. 
mean, it just sounds amazing, like lecture halls and, and gardens and whatnot. And doesn't, don't the Wiccans- Everyone's in harmony. Everyone's in harmony. Don't the Wiccans describe it as the, like you mentioned borderland, but it was like the place where you go if your soul has elevated to a certain level of spiritual awareness, wisdom, and that's where you kind of hang out between lives, but you have to be more advanced to be there. Does that ring a bell? I'm not sure about, I know that, I know that Wiccans teach that you hang out there. I'm not sure about the needing to be advanced or not part. I mean, there's, there's surprisingly little information on the internet about Summerland. There was a movie though, which you and I watched yeah, called it Summerland. Wasn't- yeah. Wasn't that good of a movie, but it was about this, this very concept from spiritualism. So the, the concepts out there, it's just not easy to find much information about it. It wasn't that it wasn't a good movie. I actually liked it, but, but you and I went into it, like it's called Summerland. Like we were really excited about this idea within the film and the film didn't focus on it so much. But yeah. anyway, d- d- I'm fascinated by the idea that, I mean, this world, it, the world that we live in now is the product of the collective thoughts of those who are here. And this world is not a great place. And so Summerland feels like an evolution. And so I've got my mind kind of spinning on, oh, is there another, can we graduate from this place with spiritual enlightenment and go to more of a harmonious place with gardens and lecture hall. Not that this place doesn't have gardens and lecture halls, but you know what I mean? Like a more spiritually advanced kind of place. Can we get there through the lessons that we learn if we learn them here? Well, I suspect that's, that's true. And, and just to be clear, we're not saying the real world is Summerland. I mean, Summerland is a place you go to when your body kicks over and, and the real world is, is here, but there is a, and the connections will be, become more apparent as we go. But yeah, I mean, I think that's what's basically going to happen, you know, for those of us who are, who are, you know, not completely lost in ego, I think we're going to go to something just like Summerland, just like a paradise. Yeah. And, and it's I'm not, glad that- not the furthest place to go, but hey, it's gotta be well, it just this, feels right? like if, if we're all getting to heaven, there's, if there is a stair step process to get us there, summer, summerland feels like a, a more, one more step than, than here, one step yeah. higher than here. But yeah. I, I'm glad that you made that distinction that, that summerland is it like the real world and summerland are not synonymous. The real world is something we can see here in this world, in these bodies. Right. Right. And, and, but as long as we're talking about parallels, the real world and Summerland are also kind of parallel to, um, or at least they're referenced in NDEs. So do you want to share more about that as well? Yeah, this is, I think, a really interesting thing that has just had me so riveted. And I'll do occasional, I'll go online and try to search for near-death experiences that have certain qualities to them. So first of all, many NDEs, near-death experiencers, report something un- uncannily like Summerland. They'll often speak of, of experiencing, you know, in the afterlife they visit, or at least seem to visit, cities with halls of learning. Um, they also speak of natural scenes with incredibly beautiful grass and flowers and trees. But interestingly, they, they speak of everything having its own inner radiance, glowing with its own consciousness, intelligence, with a a divine light within it, um, so that the forms are kind of translucent. And what's really interesting is just like those real world descriptions in the course, everything is loving them, even the grass. And I've come across a number of NDEs that have that quality. And I, a lot of them, I just, heard and I thought that's just like the course I didn't like write them down um, but I still managed to collect quite a few but what's interesting again is just like the real world descriptions everything's glowing with a divine radiance within and everything is loving them so I had a few I want to just go ahead and read because 
you know, they basically make the point perfectly. So in one of them, a woman is in on the other side, looking at a perfect, magnificent daisy, which glowed in brilliant colors. And she said, it was alive and it loved me. Somebody else said, I looked around at the trees and there was an aura of warmth and care emanating from them. They were aware of me. Exuding from the trees was love and acceptance. Someone else said, the grass, trees, and flowers were all so exquisite that my mind said so. And then return, a vibration of love flowed back to me from them. And finally, um, Nancy Rhines, who's a well-known NDE out there, she said, I felt a deep sense of love, that a deep sense of that love flowing through all things around me, the air, the ground below my feet, the trees, the clouds, and me, as though this place were built from love and peace on a very grand cosmic scale. It's amazing. And as we've been talking about this idea that everything can love you, and we've been kind of joking that it, that it feels like a Disney movie, and I don't, I don't want to take, go too far with that because I, I don't, it's not a joke. And it's also, I don't want to make it seem like it's this naive place to be mentally. We believe this is actually the, the most sophisticated place that you can be mentally here. This is, as you were saying earlier, when you're seeing with vision what the course calls vision, true perception, what you're seeing is the real world. You're seeing only loving thoughts as true, only the holiness in everything and only God's purpose in everything. That is not a naive position. It's actually a very, very powerful position to hold that can, can move us through the challenges of life in, in a, in a, in a very solid and grounded way. You know, maybe, I mean, we've all, given that I've raised four children, I've seen a million of those movies where, you know, you have the, the, the young girl, the princess, whatever, and everything in nature is like, you know, sewing <laughs> dresses for her and <laughs> to get to the ball. Um, I mean, maybe that's kind of a, a, a sort of a trite, more superficial echo of something we all sense deep inside that there is a state in which rather than having this antagonistic relationship where we're in the real world, the dog eat dog world, there's a state where everything really is in harmony and everything really is kind of there for us rather than there to take advantage of us. Yeah. You could really, if you wanted to do an essay, you could go really deep with that. The Holy Spirit could be the fairy godmother. And was she really <laughs> in a, a coach or was it all an illusion? <laughs> you know, so we could, we could go down the rabbit hole with that. But anyway, it, it, to make, again, just to sort of button up that point, it is a very sophisticated place in which to live because the, the, those who we know who go through life without this kind of a spiritual foundation do tend to crack uh, and and kind of crumble under the weight of the pressures that we face here, and and so it, it's just it's not only a beautiful thing to see the real world in this world, but it's it's a very wise place to grow your life from. Yeah, yeah. So what what has also intrigued me? Just so just to recap, the course describes the real world as you walk through this world and you see what's real and what's real is the holiness, the divine radiance in everything. And what's real is they're all actually loving you, leaning toward you to bless you. And then we've seen that mirrored in stories, reports of the afterlife, you know, where people appear to cross over and everything is glowing with an inner radiance and everything is loving them, which is such a specific pair 
of attributes, of qualities. But what's really interesting to me is that when people report having experiences of what the Course calls vision or true perception, they will see those same two characteristics. And I've collected from different places, you know, people's experiences of vision, they're actually surprisingly common. And I have a list of, looks like three that are all from course students. A couple from the circle, one from, I just found their story online. Um, but let me go ahead and read these. And so here are people on earth, right? In this world, in the body, having experiences of what the course calls vision. So one of them says, everywhere I looked, I saw love. I specifically remember every blade of grass transmitting love. It was almost unbearable. Somebody else says, I remember looking down at the steering wheel and I saw it was love. The trees were shimmering with love. The space between, it was filled with love. And then finally, someone says, it was as if everything in the room had an inner aliveness, which was communicating with me and pouring love on me. Everything from the cupboard door to the curtains to the clothes on the floor. It was literally as if its only purpose in being there was to love me. So anyway, I just think to find echoes of the course's description of the real world, first in people's descriptions of the afterlife, but then in people's descriptions of vision in this life makes a really big statement. Yeah, it does. And it's one of those things where you look out in the world and you see, okay, this is what the course teaches on a certain idea. And then when you see it echoed in these other places where sometimes those who are sharing their experience are course students, like what the ones you've just read, and sometimes they're not. You know, yeah. Summerland is not connected to the course, but it sounds yeah. course-like. The, you can bet we'll bring up NDEs at some point because it's, a, it's incredible that people have these experiences. And again, most of them are not course students. That's only a tiny little fraction and, and are course students. And when they're course students, it tends to be because they came back with a course-like experience and discovered the course afterwards. And the so- The first one I read was like that. She had her experience and then she discovered the course afterwards and thought, hey, this is the same. This is what's go this is what I saw. Yeah. And so when in the ears or when those who have some experience with Summerland come back with these experiences and they just sound so course like, it's it's incredible and it's nice to see them echoed around. But I, I imagine that there are people who are listening who are like, okay, that sounds great, but I, I can't have that experience right now. And the course teaches that you can. So do you want to say more about that? Yeah, well, I want to kind of slide into that by just talking about what to me is, is sort of the, the punchline. Uh, life in this world is hard. And it's hard because of what we typically call the real world, right? The dog eat dog world. We're in this antagonistic relationship and everything seems to either be out to get us, take advantage of us, or just doesn't care and just runs over us without thinking. Um, that's why it's so hard because it seems like the world to some degree is against us and doesn't care about us. And, and, so, sorry, I was, or so we think. I mean, or so we, we think. We do a lot of lying to ourselves and and one example of that is a girlfriend came to visit me over the weekend and she was just in a bad place feeling kind of that life had truly let her down and and the stories that she was telling me about why I knew weren't true because I've known her for years and so when she's like this guy left me for example I had to be like 
you actually broke up with him and told him not to contact you. And now you're going to say you were abandoned. So part of why it's a dog eat dog world in our mind is because we don't tell ourselves the truth. And part of not telling ourselves the truth is not, uh, is clinging to the stories versus the loving thoughts. Yeah. And it's the way that we contribute to the dog eat dog nature of this place. I mean, if we're in that mindset, how are we going to be towards other people? Anyway, um, because of that experience of living in a hard world, or at least experiencing it as hard, there's something in us that longs, longs for paradise in which it's not a dog eat dog world, in which it's all harmony, in which everything and everyone's loving us and we're loving them. And what the course is saying is that, yes, that's there in the afterlife. And of course, isn't saying that part, but I'll add that part on it. But if we had eyes to see, if we could see deeply enough in this world, we would see that in this world. We would see a reality right here where everything's glowing with a divine radiance and where everything is loving us. Everything is leaning toward us to bless us. Basically what the Course is saying in so many words is we can live in Summerland right here. And that is not a fantasy. That's the real world. That's what's so amazing about it is, again, we we keep lying to ourselves. And and part part of the reason why we think it's such an attacking world is because of the stories that we keep alive in our head about us being attacked, whether or not those are true. And so if we... If we say, okay, I'm going to see the world differently. I'm going to see the world through the eyes of love. I'm going to reach true perception and see with vision, see only the loving thoughts is true, only God's purpose and holiness and everything. Then we, we will drop that attack, the stories of attack and be living in only what is real and and that's so much of what the course is trying to teach us in in all its lessons yeah yeah i mean what the course is saying is if we if we do that deeply enough we actually open up eyes in us that are not the physical eyes and they see beyond the forms the course is has no illusions about how the forms tend to behave in this world right the mosquitoes do bite you know, the, some animals do attack. People definitely attack, right? The forms behave oftentimes in very vicious, exploitative ways. Um, But if we have those, those deeper eyes open, we can see something going on behind the forms. We can see that within every one of those forms is a light of awareness and of love that's loving us, even if the forms are not behaving that way. And so ultimately it's about opening those, those spiritual eyes within us. Yeah. And we've talked so much in this podcast about the Holy Spirit and Jesus and, and what the Holy Spirit is leading us to as our guide, what Jesus is leading us to as as our guide. And this feels like it, like they're leading us to Mm. this kind of perception where we only see what is true. The Holy Spirit is incapable of seeing anything else. And so that's, that's the journey that we're on is to, is to see what's true and drop everything else. And, and that's what the real world is when you're seeing only what is true, you're seeing the real world. And so that's yeah. just, it feels to me like all the lessons are kind of tied together in that way. Oh, this yeah. is what this Jesus is, was able to do here on earth. This is what exactly, this is what the course is, is, has set as our goal on the journey it's taking us on. Um, and this is all intimately tied with forgiveness. You asked a minute ago, like, how do we get there? And again and again, the course says we open the eyes of Christ in us. We, we open our capacity to see with vision through forgiveness. And it just ties, you know, over and over, it ties our ability to see the real world 
to having been willing to forgive. So, so what does it say forgive, about that specifically? Oh yeah. Okay. Well, that, that part in chapter 17 that I mentioned where it's like, you know, can you imagine how beautiful those who you forgive will look to you? That's, that's all talking about you forgive them. And then you see the divine beauty in them that your eyes haven't seen. Um, there is a beautiful uh, place in chapter 31 in the text that basically says, if you learn the lesson that God's son is guiltless, which is forgiveness, right? To learn that everyone's guiltless, that's another way of talking about forgiveness. You'll see a world in which everyone and everything is calling to you in soft appeal, asking to be your friend and to be allowed to join with you. And it says, you know, how wrong are you? who fail to hear that call. You know, we've been hearing the surface calls, which are often calls for death, right? It's a, it's a vicious world. But if we had learned that God's son is guiltless, we would hear beneath those to, to the deeper calls in which everyone's saying, will you be my friend? Will you let me join with you? Can you imagine living in that world? And then finally in lesson 68, um, which we've already referenced as a world that protects you and loves you. The way you get there is you go through a whole list of people you have grievances toward and you let go of your grievances. And then you experience this world where rather than it being against you, where you're safe because it protects you and loves you. So in all three of those instances, we get to that perception of the real world through simply being willing to forgive. So if we're not seeing the real world the way we described it, we have forgiveness work left to do. There's a question in the chat from um, someone who's joining us live about how to apply this to situations in the world like Uvalde. And so what would you say to that? Because there are obviously times where the world seems like a very, very cruel and vicious place. And so how do we overlay this lesson on, on the reality that we see in our TV screens? Yeah, well, I think that we tend to think in terms of, you know, what's the right opinion about what, you know, policy measures should, should be enacted to prevent something like this, or is it important to prevent? We tend to live on that level of opinion, right? And you do need to generate opinions, at least of things where you, you're required to act yourself, things in your own life. You know, opinions just can't be avoided. But I think what the course would say is more important than that, like alongside that, but even more important, is just realizing what the constant reality is that underneath the forms, every single person is glowing with holiness, with divine radiance, and every single person involved, whether we would call them a criminal or murderer, whether we call them a victim, whether we call them somebody on the other side of the political spectrum or, or what, everyone underneath that is loving us, leaning toward us to bless us. And that's always true. So it may seem like it's irrelevant if it's always true, but if we could live in that sense of it's always true, we would have a different effect on everybody, even as we talked about our opinions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, such a high bar, isn't it? It is, mm -hmm. yeah. Because mm -hmm. I think as course students, we sometimes are very often we think, well, I know that, okay. But what's relevant here and we need to realize that the truths that are always true are the most relevant here. That's well said, Robert. Yeah. No exceptions means no exceptions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, is there anything else that you want to say on this topic before we close? I, 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 I hope it's clear to everyone what the real world is and how you are able to see it here amid this world. And, and I hope that we can take this and really 
make a, a genuine effort to apply it to our lives and see only what is true as the course is asking us to do. Yeah, I think just to reiterate that what for me is the big punchline is we can we can live in that afterlife paradise right here because that's the reality here even if we don't currently see it we're living in summerland here we just don't have eyes to see that are open but doesn't it feel like a muscle though so i know the course presents it as the spiritual eye that opens and then we are able to see with true perception, which is also the same as vision and what we're seeing is the real world and the real world is that only living thoughts are true. I hope that sequence is clear in everyone's mm, mind. I hope so too, yeah. But it feels to me like something that just gets stronger the more you apply it, the more you do it, the, the more you're in the workbook, for example, um, training yourself to see in this way. And, and that's, that speaks to the importance of, of daily practice and practicing throughout the day. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I mean, that, that very first thing that I read about the, you know, say to yourself, the real world is not like this. It has no buildings and there are no streets. Nothing is there, but shines and shines forever. That's a practice. He's giving us a practice for drawing the real world nearer. And that same section goes on to say that basically the only thing you have to do to have the real world is to want it more than you want the world you see. Mm -hmm. And, and that means you have to want to forgive more than you want to hold on to your story Yeah. about why you shouldn't forgive. Yeah. And, and this feels to me like JFK said, fix the roof while the sun is shining. I mean, we do our practice every day. So that when life throws us a curveball or when we feel hurt or betrayed by someone, then we have these tools at our disposal and we can still see clearly even amid the chaos and conflict that, that is often this world. Yeah. I mean, I, I think your, your point is a really good one. We have to sort of exercise the muscle, the practice, the wanting of it, the forgiving in the understanding that that's what's real, whether we see it or not. And if we exercise that muscle enough, we will begin to have more and more glimpses of it. And at some point it'll be a stable experience. And at some point it could be all you see. Right. That's, that's what, that's the state that Jesus got to speaking of high bars, but still. Yeah. Yeah. All right, yeah. Robert. Well, I think that we have covered this, uh, at least what we wanted to say about it. So thank you, as always, for your time and for illuminating these topics in the course with and for us. And thanks to everyone who has joined us live for our podcast recording today. As a reminder, if you'd like to join us for live podcast recordings, we do this every Tuesday at 11 a.m. Eastern, and it's a free service from The Circle. And if you would like to receive the link, just visit circleofa.org forward slash events. We'll see you next Tuesday. Bye for now.